Praise the Lord. I don't know if I'm going to sound like a preacher, but I sure do look like one. <laughs> I looked myself up in the mirror, and thanks to my wife. <laughs> Suggest she suggested all these colors, and uh, yeah. But I'll tell you something. I don't feel worthy of the calling, but that's man's wisdom. Sometimes we look at the situations. I don't feel like I'm ready. Even a couple of weeks back, I didn't think I was ready. I felt I was the most unworthiest person. But you know, God doesn't look at who you are. God, the way God sees you is so different. The plans that he has for your life is so different. You know, last week, I just finished worship and I went to the washroom. You know, I, I thought I'd go to the washroom before I come up here. I didn't have time. But last, I was just reminded of an incident. I went to the washroom. And then I opened, and opened the door and I was about to come out and there was someone waiting to enter the washroom. And the first line he says was, uh, oh, it was nice, huh? I was wondering what was he talking about. <laughs> it took me some time to connect it that he was talking about the worship. <laughs> and uh, amongst those things, there were other things that were nice. Last week was an amazing week for me. You know, it was just, a uh, lo lot of you were here. So many of you heard uh, the prophecy that came on. It was such a special prophecy. Um, I mean, uh, just now, sister was saying, you know, unless the miracle happens to you, don't know. To others, it might not mean anything much, you know. The healing, when it comes to you, you know it. And God really speaks to you at the point of your need. And I needed God to speak to me. Not only did I need God to speak to me, God needed to speak to Priscilla. And... Uh, I just wanted Priscilla to come and share a little bit for about a few minutes what the Lord had done in her life. I feel the only reason I'm doing this is I feel little by it. it will bless you. All right? Hello, church. Praise the Lord. I'm just so blessed to stand here. I thought I wouldn't even be standing here today like this in this state of mind, body, and heart. If I can only think of what God has done for me, I can't even count. Even the stars cannot really be enough for me to tell what the Lord has been doing for me. As a kid, I have been going, I have, I went through so much that I can't even think of. I didn't have a childhood. I didn't have a youth. But here I am today still standing for His glory. I just want to say what the Lord has done for me last Friday was life transforming for me. I needed God to speak to me. As a kid, I was labeled, you are this, you are that. But there's one who knew my heart. That is my God. So I used to always make it Psalms 139. Lord, you form me. You form my inward parts. You know every thought that goes in my heart, in my mind. You know every intention I have. And then things have been going so rough with me for a long time. Even after marriage, it was not a smooth thing for me because from the place I was coming from, I had so many things to deal with. But God knows where I should be. God has blessed me with a family who stood by me, uncle, auntie, the way they stood by me, no father-in-law and mother-in-law would stand by you. The things that I went through, they would, they would just give up on you. But they, that's how God has put in their heart to stand for me. My husband, the things that he has done, I can't even count his sacrifices, his sleepless nights for me. So I just want to say, and last Friday was... Something that I was done. Lord, I, I was like, I was crying out desperately to God. I was begging God. God, you have to speak up for me. I'm done, Lord. I used to go through mental trauma. I used to cry day and night. I used to, so I'm not ashamed to stand here and tell. Because I don't care what people think. Because God has done this for me. And I'm going to stand here boldly and say that, yes, I went through that. I had gone through mental trauma. I had gone through depression. I had gone through things I cannot even say. It, like, I cannot, it, the time is not enough to express what I went through. Every moment was a trauma. Every moment was a torture for me. I, I, I mean, I can't even breathe. I can't even sit. I can't sit for five minutes with rest. I know many people would have noticed that me going away from the church. Yes, because I was going through a lot. I cannot stand the congregation. I cannot stand people. I had phobias. I had so many things to deal with. It was not a smooth thing for me. But there was a family that stood by me. And above all, there was a God that stood by me. And last Friday, what God has done, he spoke to me. He stood up for me in front of everyone. People might have thought million things about me, but my God knew who I was. My God knew what my heart was. So today, 
even if you feel that you are being blamed or if you feel that you are you're not being understood but remember god understands you god knows your heart and he will stand up for you when you cry out to him he is the one who gives you justice he is the one who lifts you up in front of the people you were let down so that is my god last friday god the touch which i got from god has delivered me from the trauma it has delivered me from i mean like that touch i still live in that touch that presence of god has been flowing in me from that very moment I, one touch from god can absolutely dim, like like it can change your life like anything you cannot even imagine no matter what state of your heart is the state of the heart i was in i thought i can't do it anymore i was like no this trauma won't leave me this depression won't leave me my heart is never going to feel all right but 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 still i knew that there is a god who is looking me i used to just sit and read psalms 139 lord you know me lord you know me yes and he knew me i am standing here because of what the lord has done for me i didn't have the strength to even face anyone like this but when the spirit of the lord comes upon you you get boldness you can stand you are not ashamed of who you are because god called you to be who he wants you to be so you should never be ashamed of what you went through but that you should only bring it for the glory of god so today i might have gone through things which people might think what is she what she went through where does she come from but yes today i still stand here because of who is in me jesus that one touch of god and that day i also didn't come expectedly like god will you even hear me i was so broken i was so lost i was just in misery i just cried out i lifted up my hands and that day the first word came right into my life he said God directly spoke to me I love you and when God loves you it doesn't matter who doesn't love you if God loves you it doesn't matter who cares for you so today I just want to encourage you all that he is the God who knows your heart even if you feel you have not done just you have not been done justice just don't give up because there's a God who sits on the throne who does justice to his people who does justice to his people he will never leave you know, even in your workplace if you are let down don't give up there's a God who will make you stand up there right there he will speak for you on your behalf he will defend you because he is a defender yes he is my defender he will defend you as well so i just want to thank you i want to thank manohar uncle viji aunty krishya ka john and and jasper the way they stood by me the way they protected me the way they loved me it's if it was not god no human being could have done what they have done for me i believe it was god in in them that made me here stand here today i also want to thank beena aunty dennis uncle they really stood by me beena aunty spent all her time on me she stood by me she gave me always pushing me today if i stand here i am not ashamed i want to say i went through that but i am here because of jesus who is inside of me and i want to say that jesus will also lift you up when you trust in him hallelujah bashikaraba thank you in jesus name i just want to give all glory to the father and i also want to thank you everyone who always loved me with and welcome me warm komal thank you so much hallelujah bashikaraba thank you in jesus name amen wow she should preach <laughs> Amen. You know she's learning her identity in Christ. She's learning her identity in Christ. She's knowing who she is in Christ. And that's something that we all should do too. You know last week was just so amazing because it was not just something that God did for her and for many more people. You know it was something that God confirmed. I knew what I had to speak about almost 3 or 4 weeks back. I had just a title ready. and uh, didn't have material but i had a title i know what direction god wanted me to speak to um go th- i mean move towards and so when michael started to speak uh everything was a confirmation from the biblical characters he took and from his own his very message if you remember how many of you remember what michael spoke last week anything any memory seeing seeing right he that was the last thing he said vision vision and i and that's something that really spoke to my heart i was like man i told you can you can ask priscilla i actually wrote down the title way before he, it was he he spoke it and i just showed her showed it to her saying see look he's speaking this you know he was talking about vision he was talking about creating this image in front of you amen and that's something i want to talk about you know uh, we all we all have visions we all have a vision of something we might not think i mean we might say that 
oh God, I'm challenged, I do not have visions. Let's forget, let's forget a spiritual side and just think about it. Do you imagine things? Does, did all of you imagine something? Yeah? God, you might be saying, God, I don't have uh, this great ability to see things in the spirit or do anything of that sort. But it starts with imagining. How many of you have imagined things? All right, kids, yeah, that, I was looking for a show of hands. You imagine things? Anyone? I'm talking about images. I'm not talking about hearing a voice. See, God spoke, speaks to people. We've been hearing about the voice of God a lot of times. And God's voice is powerful. He speaks to people. He speaks in our hearts. I believe God speaks audibly to people. I believe in the voice of God. But I think we need to take this step further. God can speak through visions. We don't think, a lot of us think that, okay, visions are not for me. Visions are not for, I mean, it's, it's not something that it's, it's, meant, it's probably meant for that person, but not for me. But you have seen visions in your life. You have seen, how many of you have seen dreams? Any dream. I'm not talking about a spiritual dream. If you've seen a dream, you have seen something. There is an ability to see. And very often, it's usually, it boils down to um, the inputs. If I've seen Avengers last night, I could very well imagine, I don't know any characters, I don't know Avengers that much, I just saw the movie title. I, I don't know any names, but let me think about some. Okay, let, if I saw Jurassic World last night, I can imagine what a T-Rex would look like, right? And I'd start having images. You can create those images in your mind. There is an ability in every human's mind to create the image. It depends on what your input is. A lot of the times, we mo I mean, a lot of the times we just don't think words. Let me tell you that. A lot of the times we think images. This is true. Anyone did something wrong in your office and then you were going to go to office the next morning and did you get an image of your boss about to scream to you? Did you, anyone have that? Or let's say you went to school and you didn't do your homework. Did you think and imagine how your teacher would shout at you? Come on, speak to me. Did you think? You got an imagination. It works. You know, we just don't use that as a tool. God has given it as a tool for us to work in the kingdom. It's a tool of victory in our lives. Imagination, vision is a tool of victory in our life. All right. <clears throat> um, Psalms chapter 72. Uh, so you don't need to turn there. I'm just going to read it from, um, from here. Psalms chapter 72 says uh, that you limit God with, you, no, yeah, the, the children of Israel sinned against God and limited Him. I think this is something that we do. We limit God to our idea of God. We don't think that God can speak through images anymore. We don't think that He can, see, I'll tell you something. Thomas, we call him the doubting Thomas, but he wanted to see. The power of a vision of seeing Christ himself was more powerful than, than what he heard. There is a certain power in a vision. And I just wonder, I don't know, I'm just being led here. Excuse me, I'm not going to be, this is not me speaking, all right? But I feel God's asking the leaders of the church. Sorry, not me. God's asking, what vision do you have for this church? Are you just seeing a verse? And going by, by verse, God's asking, did you actually see, did you imagine this, would, this is what it would look like? This is the building that it would, it would look like. These are the number of chairs that are going to be placed. And these are the number of people that are going to be sitting. Did you think, did you have a vision of how the children's ministry would look like? Did you have a vision of how the youth ministry would look like? Did you have a vision? Did you, did you see it? Did you imagine it? Did you start over there? Did you imagine that one day everybody sitting here is going to be serving in the ministry somehow? Not, be, not by sitting over here, but doing something for this church. Is there an image that you have seen? I'll tell you something. There's a difference between a visionary and a normal man. There are very few visionaries in this, in this world. Usually, most of the big top companies, we call them visionaries because they see something. They have a vision for their company. They know what they're going for. They have a picture. The problem is, why are there so few successful people in a worldly sense? People, the world looks at success as money and fame.
But why are there so few of them? It's because we have more hearers and less visionaries. There are less visionaries and more hearers. We need to know the power of a vision. God has given this to us, 29.18, if you want the verse. Without a vision, the people perish. Where's your vision? Are you perishing? Are you attempting to see something? Today I'm going to look uh, at a man of vision, the making of a man of vision, all right? Uh, King David. This is one of the reasons I said there was confirmation because, because the preacher last week talked about King David. My mom spoke about King David just two days back and I knew that God was upon it. But I'm going to recreate the story of David and Goliath. Old story. We're going to dwell on us. First Samuel chapter 17. All right. But let's see. The first thing I want to paint, you know, is when you see the story of David and Goliath, I want to paint the picture of Goliath for you. All right, let's, see, let's just read through it. 1 Samuel chapter 17. All right. From verse 1, I'll keep reading. Now the Philistines gathered, army, gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered in, okay, Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between that place and another place in another place. I'm just skipping out all the names because they are difficult names to pronounce. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley, I can pronounce this name, the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Now here, we pay attention from here. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was about six cubits and a span. Okay, six cubits in a span is about roughly 2.9 meters. From the stage, I think it hits the ceiling. This might be three meters or a little bit over three meters. I have a good uh, spatial intelligence or visual intelligence because that's part of my job. So it's about that high. Now imagine me looking up to this guy. He's about that. You can put a beard on his face. It makes him look a little bit more ferocious. And uh, he's about that high. And it's about it's nine feet, around nine feet, okay? He had a bronze helmet on his bronze helmet on his head and was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was about 5,000 shekels of bronze. I think it comes close to about 60 kilos. So imagine you're going to India and you have the limit of, of, uh, of 30 uh, you know, kilos per baggage. Now imagine two of those baggages and it's the weight of this coat. That was what he was carrying and walking around. That was his armor, right? That was just his mail of coat, made of bronze. And then he had a helmet on his head, all right? And uh, he had a bronze, he had bronze armor on his leg and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. So now he had, imagine his entire, his legs were covered with bronze again, with metal. This is the ideal uh, Iron Man, you know? And then he had a spear, which is at the back, and it was the size of a weaver's beam. An iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, about roughly 7 kilos. That's your hand baggage. That's just the head of that spear. All right? And a shield bearer went before him. Now, here's what he's doing. You got an image. Did you all imagine with me how high? I want you to stand and look at this. If you're facing this guy, he's about that high, the height of the wall. Just look up. That's the guy. He's that high. And you're going to face him. And he was, and this is what he proposed. He told the Israelites, okay, listen, if there's a strong man among you, just bring him, let me face him. He says openly, you know, uh, in verses 10, and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. He says, I defy an army. I, I defy the armies of Israel. The whole point is there's a challenge in front of you. We all know how to picture a challenge very well. We all know how to do it. Because our minds are very so filled with negativity at most of the time. It's around us. The world is a negative place. There's so much of war. There's so much of crime. There's so much of corruption. There's so much of evil. We tend to picture evil better. So this is the picture. And it was so vivid because it was so real. And what happened? What had happened to the children of Israel? 
When Saul and all of Israel, verse 11, when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. All right, so there was a problem for Israel, but little did this problem know that he was going to have a real problem in the form of King David, who wasn't a king at that time. All right, let's focus a bit on King David now, because I painted a good picture of what the problem looks like. A big man with a lot of metal around his body, almost close to 70 kgs of metal around his body. But then, David was not, in this st- was not here at this time. David was the making of a man of a vision. And I'll tell you why in, a, in some time. We'll progress through the story, and I'll tell you why was he a man of vision. But I'll tell you something that made up this man of the vision. The first thing I want to talk about is love. Love is the first thing that makes up a man of vision. Not just any love. It's love for your God. You know, David was called a man after God's own heart. What that means in, in it, uh, is that he, he chased, he pursued God. He pursued God. What does the love of God look like? You know, the love of God is love for his word and doing his will. Simple. Jesus said that very clearly. You know, in, um, in uh, John chapter 14, 21, it says, He who has my commandments and keep them, is, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. David, you can see in his life that he loved God. And if you see the Psalms, and all the, just go through one Psalm, Psalm 119. You'll see all that he talks about continuously is the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. He had so much of love for the Word. Just read through all these Psalms. I mean, that, it's a long Psalm, the longest chapter in the Bible. But read through it. You'll see how much David loved the Word of God. He had such a great love for God. Now the thing is, did David, when Scripture talks about David and, call, and God calls him man after my own heart, is it after he became king that God calls him man after my, my own heart? Or is it after he defeats Goliath? No, when does it say? It's almost three or four chapters before this. In, I think in 1 Samuel 13. Because God rejects Saul and God tells David, I'm go- Samuel, I'm going to select a man after my own heart. I'm going to select a man after my own heart to take up this. And he, was, he didn't give the name out. But it was David at that time. If you could just turn your Bible with me to, yeah, there you go. Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 17. It says that Christ, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, next verse, may be able to comprehend with all the saints. Now I want you to, Picture this. We may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height. What is this? This is called imagery. God is trying to push you towards thinking image, not thinking just words. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, what is the length, what's the depth, what is the height. And it says, it starts with, if you, previous verse again, 17. It says, being rooted and grounded in love. It's the beginning of vision, church. It's the beginning. You need to understand what, I'm not going to speak a lot about love, but this is it. You need to understand what love means. David was a man who chased God. He was a man out of his own heart, after his own heart. He was a man who loved the word of God. He's a man who loved the presence of God. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing that made up David was that he was anointed. Okay, if you see in the previous, cha- uh, I mean, First Samuel chapter 16, uh, uh, S- Samuel goes and anoints David. There's one thing that happens, you know, in, uh, he goes to, to uh, David and when he anoints David, there's something that happened. If you could just read from um, 13, verses 13, 16 and verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And then what happens? The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. When he was anointed, the Spirit of the Lord, what? What came upon David? Let's talk here. What came upon David? The Spirit of the Lord came upon David. 
The Spirit of God came upon David. You know, you might say, oh God, I'm not anointed. I'm, I'm not anointed. This is, this is not for me. God has not anointed me. I don't, I don't think that God has anointed me. But the Lord says that He has anointed you. He has anointed you. I think it's, it's 1 John in which it says, let me say, I didn't pick up that scripture. Let me say, 1 John talks about, sorry, 220. <laughs> but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. This is again talking about picture. You get to know when the Spirit anointing comes upon you, you know that your imagery or whatever you start visioning is not of you, but it's of the Spirit. Amen? Ephesians chapter 1 verses 17. Paul actually calls the Spirit the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. The Spirit of wisdom and revelation. It says that the God of our Lord, sorry, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Amen. See, the thing is, you might say, God has not anointed me. But the scripture, the word says, you are anointed. And what you should believe? What's your excuse? You have been anointed. You just have to believe it. Understand that when you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, He gave you the Holy Spirit. You have been anointed with Christ. Amen? In Christ. Amen? Are you anointed in Christ? Do you have the Spirit of God in you? That's what you need. Do you, you just need the Spirit of God. Alright, I'm going to do a bit of reading from um, 1 Samuel. Again, back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. You can just park your Bibles, iTab, uh, iPads, iTabs, I was about to say, <laughs> on, uh, on uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll just be doing a lot of reading from there. And I will read from verses 22. Just to continue the story, after, the, after Goliath came, so uh, they, it just switches the scenes and David's dad tells him to go and give some supplies to his brother. And so David really reaches the camp uh, where the armies were in battle array and, and he wants to go and meet his brothers. And it says from verses 22, I'm continuing from there, and David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Alright. Verses 23. Then he talked with them. There was a champion. Sorry. Then as he talked with them. There was the champion. Talking about, the, uh, about Goliath. The Philistine of Gath. Goliath by name. Coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And as he spoke. According to the same words. That is he kept defying the children of Israel. So David heard them. So what happened? David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. And it says, David must have already seen the men. First he heard them and he saw the men of Israel running away. And they were dreadfully afraid. Verses 25. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely, surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes. Verses 26. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? All right. Until then, David was watching. He heard Goliath. He heard, he saw the men of Israel probably run away. But it was up to this point when they talked about the reward. The riches, the daughter, and the exemption from taxes. That caught his attention. See, David was a young man. It could catch his attention. He was a, the next thing I want to tell you, tell you about, David is a man of hope. All right? He was, he had a great hope. He saw what the Lord had given. He saw the opportunity. Until then he was quiet. But then he, he re-asked there. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? And then he says, For who is this un uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This is amazing. David had a hope. 
David's eye was on the prize. And many of you young men who, who have not been married, now I'm married so I can't relate to this anymore. I think David was more after the daughter than anything else. I mean, there are some, a lot of marriages that happen here that were love marriages and I'm just looking around, the people know whom I'm talking about, but the first time you saw that woman or the first time you saw that man, did you have a vision of that man? Did you have your eyes on a reward? Did you or did you not? No one's saying anything because everyone's too shy. <laughs> but yes, David had his eye on a reward. But I think, I want to take you a little bit more deeper. I don't think it was just that reward. The money could have been there. The daughter could have been there. And the exemption from taxes could have been there. But I think, more, I think David was more interested in the daughter for one reason. All right, if you could just turn from me, for me to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll read from 16. I'll just go through this. Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 16. We'll keep reading through. Do not cease to give, this is Paul praying for the church in Ephesians. All right, this is what he says. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Next verse. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. All right? That the, what? When you see eyes, what does it mean? Images, vision. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, Paul says three things here. Three things he's praying for. That you sh the reason for your eyes should be, that sh it should be enlightened is because that you may know what is the hope of His calling. Let's read it together. That you may know what is the hope of His calling. That's one. Second, what are the riches of His glory, of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And the next one, third point, what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His mighty power? There are three things that Paul talks about. I want to go back to the previous verse. The first thing he prays for is, verses 18, why your vision should be in line, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. I want to tell you something. David gets anointed in verses 16. Sorry, chapter 16. And when, the, when, when Samuel anoints him, do you know that Samuel did not, anoint him as king. He didn't tell anyone he was anointing as king. He just anointed him because no one was supposed to know that he was king. So in my understanding, it doesn't say anything. In my understanding, neither did his father or did anyone know that he was going to be a king. He was anointed to be a king. He was just anointed. Nobody knew for what. But I believe the spirit of revelation and knowledge began to reveal to him that he was going to be a king. That's what I believe, that he was going to be a king. And you know what happens next? David starts to move towards the palace. God starts opening doors. When was the first time that David went to the palace? Anyone know? When Saul had an evil spirit. So God put an evil spirit upon Saul. And David went to the palace. And he used to play his, his harp. And then the evil spirit would leave. That was the first time Saul, uh, David went into the, king, into the king's palace. He was moving towards a direction. But you know something? Saul didn't know him after that. Just by him going and playing that lie, Saul did not know him. He did not know him. You'll see that later on in, in, chapter, eight, in chapter 17, after David actually slays Goliath, Saul actually asks his, uh, his men, uh, who is this man? You know, David talked with, with, with Saul, but he asked, who is this man? He had already got an introduction before. Someone told Saul about him, but he was not known. So what happens? So David finishes off going and playing for Saul, and he comes to this place, and I think it's the Spirit of God that sees the opportunity, and he says, okay, I'm going to get closer to the kingdom. Let me get close to the daughter. That's what I believe propelled David. It was not just the riches. It was the hope of the calling that propelled David towards this vision. Amen? It was the hope of the calling that propelled David towards, towards his vision. When the rest of Israel were running for their lives, David was running for his prize. 
He was running for the vision. He was running because of the hope that was in him. That is why you need the anointing. And that is why you need the Spirit of God. Because it reveals to you at the right time why you're supposed to be there and for what. He spoke out and he said, what happens when David says this? He kept saying, well, who, and who, are the, who, are these, uh, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the Lord? And then people, his brothers come up. And, 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 tell, and you know, this is what they say. They were very mean with him. It's quite interesting. Now, Eliab, who is the oldest brother, the big brother is here. He heard him and he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was arose. This is from verses 28 of uh, chapter 17. Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Move on. Yeah. Then he turned from him towards another and said the same thing. What same thing? That who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the Lord? You don't care about what people say when the anointing is in you. There's a certain kind of boldness that operates in you that gives you the power, that gives you the strength to move towards the hope of that calling. Amen? 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 Amen. Thank you. That was great. You know, the hope of your calling shapes the direction of your vision. See, there are a lot of times, I just want to bring, it, uh, bring a point here. We say, God, I believe I'm going to be rich. You know, I believe, you know, I believe I'm going to, you know, be famous. Lord, I believe. I want to have a vision of being famous. I, want, I have a, you try and envision you being famous. You try and envision you being rich. Because a lot of us think that with riches, our problems are solved. Or a lot of us think with fame, our problems get solved. But the thing is, I want you to focus on, you need to focus on this one thing. Ask God, what is your calling? When you know what your calling is, then your vision will be set right. The visions that come out of you when you know the calling of God shapes the kind of, I mean, the, when you know the calling of God, that shapes the kind of visions and the kind of images that come towards your, that come in front of you. Amen? All right. Now, that vision was followed by a certain kind of belief. David did not let you know, the things of this world, the things that his brother was telling him to get to him. Or, the, or you know, he, he just cut, kept on moving. So what happens? He keeps saying these things. And then this word goes on. And Saul now hears about it. It says in verses 31. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. And he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man, listen to this. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him your servant will go and fight with this philistine that's the belief that came jesus says in mark chapter 9 nothing shall be impossible for you if you nothing shall be impossible for you if you when your belief is in the right direction it works then nothing shall be impossible for you you know in daniel chapter 11 verse 32 it says what Daniel chapter 11, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But listen to this part. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. This is why it's important to love the Lord because you're in his word. You know your God, it generates belief in you. And they shall carry out great exploits. And this gave David the boldness to really speak out in front of a king who, you know, who, who, who himself won many battles. And David, that little boy, you know, ruddy as he is, young boy, youth, you know, we are all youth, but look at that boy. He went and he spoke to the king. He said, don't worry. Let the people not be afraid because I will go and fight with this Philistine. Amen. All right. And verses 33. This is what Saul has to say to David. You are not able... To go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth and a man of war, from, and he a man of war from his youth. All right. For a moment, again, just turn back to I know I'm doing a lot of turning of scriptures, but I, I need to do this. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, sorry, 2, and verses 13. These things we also speak not in words which 
man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, if you see what Saul was trying to do here, we call that what? Man's wisdom. The rational man. Many times in your life, you're going to face this. When you are walking in the Spirit, people are going to tell you things that come naturally to them. So Saul was thinking, you know what? I'm going to, um, I'm going to, you are too, you're too young, you cannot do it. But David con continues to speak. And then Saul continues to say, you know what? All right, here's an armor. Here's the shield that you need to take. This is the armor, this is the shield, take it and wear it. You know, I'll tell you something. David was a man who was taught by the Spirit. Who was, that is, he was trained by the Spirit. He was tried and he was tested. You know, when, Paul, when Saul tried to discourage him, what did David say? I have faced the life. Okay, let's go back there. Let's read it together. All right. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock. Next. I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it, caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Can you imagine that? He's painting another picture. I have already been trained for this. Today, God might, you might be going through some situations. They might not be the Goliath, but they might be lions and bears. That's for your training. There are some situations that are meant for your training. And there are some other situations meant for your glory. Alright, so now here's what David is. David is going, he's telling Saul, I have been trained for this. I have been tested for this. You know, sometimes God himself leads you. Psalms chapter 66 verses 10, 10 says that God has tested us. He has refined us. You know, he says, I have been, just let's read it. For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. Next verse. Next verse. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. This is talking about God, right? You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Let's read this together. But you brought us out to a rich fulfillment. Again, but you have brought us out into a rich fulfillment. That is the reason you are going through these tests. That is the reason that you go and face lions and bears. Because God wants you to bring you to that place where you have been tested and proved. David says an interesting thing. You know why David, when he wears the armor, you know what does David say to Saul? Oh, I cannot wear this armor for it has not been tested. That's the word he used. It has not been tested. You know, a prof when the prophet was, I mean, when, when Michael started to speak to me, he's like, when you're in the field, it's different. God's preparing you. But when you go to the battlefield, it's different. God knows how to prepare you in the field. There are different tools that He prepares you with. He gives you the actual tools. People might come up with their own wisdom and tell you that you need this armor. But when God tells you something, He tells you something because He's already prepared you. He has already prepared you. He knows what you need. The Lord knows what you need. What does David do? He goes to the brook and picks up five stones i didn't mention my fifth point i said david was tried tested and approved by god before he faced goliath david goes and picks up five smooth stones for me i want to give you this picture for me those stones are the words of god today in our in our, in our church setting how do you relate to that those stones are what you the promises of god that you meditate upon the scriptures that you can use. The Bible talks about your armor. It talks about the sword of the spirit. I believe it's also the confession of your mouth. That you can really strike back at the enemy. With the word that you have in you. God has. There's something. I want you to notice something. David took five stones and he put it where? In his purse. David puts it in his purse. I'm just not going. I'm just going to continue telling the story. You can read the story for your, for your reference You know, later on. But I'm going to tell you, from 17, chapter 17, he takes the stones and puts it in his, in, in, in his purse. When he goes and meets Goliath, how many stones did it take to kill Goliath? One stone. One stone. You know something? 
First of all, there is no demon that is too strong against our God. When the word, when the demon faces the word, he has no chance. When the demon faces or any trials, any tribulations face you and you're filled with the spirit of God, it has no chance. All right? But it is your responsibility to keep collecting enough word. You need to keep those stones in your purse. David did that. He continued to keep. Don't stop with just one stone. Carry enough. You need it. Amen. So David goes and he begins to face Goliath. And this is the important part I want you to bring. So Goliath and the confrontation between Goliath and David was an interesting one. First of all, Goliath sees David and he's really angry. And he looks at him probably from afar and probably has to look down. He's like, and he, he gets insulted. Am I a dog that you, that, that you're coming before, that you send me this youth? You know, let's see what, what's the word, what's the conversation between David and uh, Goliath. Let's read from uh, verses 40. Then he took his staff in his hand and he closed, and he chose for him five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch we, which he had and a sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. All right, I want to tell you one thing. The five stones are the word and the sling is your confession. Just remember that. The sling is your confession. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield before him. Now here's the conversation. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine, so he was a pretty boy. So the Philistine said to David, I, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now here's what the picture that Goliath prints for, uh, puts for David. I will give, come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air. You can imagine Flesh and birds of the air just surrounding that and, you know, just feasting on David's flesh. You know, I mean, that, that's a good imagery. It's a dark imagery, but just imagine it. <laughs> God has asked us, uh, the whole point of this message, message is to vi- envision. All right, that's the vision that Goliath puts towards David. But here's what David puts. Verses 45. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Okay, that's how you, that's his opening line. And now look at this. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you, take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So this is the picture, that vision that David has printed out. He says three things. And I will strike you down. And I will take your head from you. You can imagine that. And this day I will give the carcasses of not just you, but the entire camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and wild beasts of the earth. That all may know that there is a God in Israel. Your vision needs to glorify God. All right? Your vision needs to bring glory to God. The next thing is, what he does is, then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not say with sword and spear, but the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. And then I want you to point out, this is another important point. God's going to give you a vision if you're ready to take action. David, what did David do? He ran towards the Philistine. God will give you a vision if he can trust you to take an action. If he can trust you to take an action, what you speak, that will be, I mean, that's what what you speak and what you envision will be inspired by God. All right. Now let's, let's proceed. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into the forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling 
and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. Does the story end there? Does the story end there? Let's read. But there was no sword in the hand of David. So here the, the, the giant is down. But what does David do? He realizes that he doesn't have a sword. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that their camp was, their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistine as far as the entrance of the valley and the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the, and the, wounded of the Philistines fell, fell, <coughs> fell along the road to whatever that name is, even as far as Gath and Ekron. All right. The story didn't end with Goliath just falling to the ground. You know, another reason God trusted David is because David was a man who pursued the vision until he saw it to its fulfillment. He had to strike down Goliath. He had to cut his head off. And he saw the Philistines run and flee back to the camp. It's important that you know that you pursue a vision until you see it come to pass, until you see it to fulfillment. I might have said a lot of scriptures and a lot of points, but I'll just recap. I'll tell you, I spoke about love that, sh that shapes your vision. I spoke about the anointing that inspires your vision. I spoke about hope that gives you direction towards vision. I, gave you, I spoke about belief that propels your vision. Then I spoke about the training and the testing that approves your vision. And then I spoke about taking action on your vision. And then I spoke about pursuing your vision until you see it to completion. This was a man of vision, David. He spoke out the word. He saw, he saw to it that the entire camp of the Philistines went back to where they belonged. This is a man of vision. This is David. You know, today that God wants to challenge us, you know. God says in, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. The power is working in us. The power we have. We have the spirit of God in us. Amen. But if you want God to do exceedingly, abundantly, you need to think. If you don't think, how can God exceed? How can God be abundant if you don't think? You need to think. You know, God has given us the mind of Christ. Paul says that. We have been given the mind of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I think it's the last verse. We have been given the mind of Christ. In those days, Moses had to stand in front of the ark and between the ark of the covenant, between the two cherubs, God would sit there on the mercy seat and speak from there. But where does God speak from now? Who is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Aren't, isn't your body the temple of the Holy Spirit? Will not God speak from within? 1 Corinthians chapter 2.16 For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have what? The mind of Christ. Do you have the mind of Christ? Do you have the mind of Christ? You have the mind of Christ when you, when you do the things that I've just spoken about. Read your word. Spend time in His presence. Then your image will start changing. Then you will be able to develop your vision. You know, you said, God, I'm not getting a vision. You start envisioning it. That's what God wants you to do. He's trying to tell you. Envision. When you're so filled with the word of God and when you're so inspired by Him, your vision changes. You start envisioning things that only God can give to you. And you need to f know that once you have that vision from God, nothing can stop it if you pursue it. I want you to, I want to tell you something. I hope the Spirit of God is, is, is moving in your hearts. A lot of the times we sing these songs. Do you envision the songs that you sing? Maybe not. Maybe it might have not dawned on you. Maybe it might still be just words. I want you to envision certain songs that we sing. Because a lot of the times, if you're able to envision it, you'll know the power that is there in the words that we sing. 
you'll know the power in the words that we sing. Amen? Amen? Let's just close our eyes for a minute. Let's just close our eyes. Do you believe that you have the ability to envision? Yes or no? Reply to. Do you believe you have the ability to envision something? You know, Paul was praying that God would open the eyes of the understanding of the church of Ephesians. He prayed for them. And I know that the Lord has given us His anointing that we may know all things. He has, we have it in us. But if you still feel like you don't have it, I want you to take a moment and ask God, God, expand my vision. God, expand my vision. Give me an idea of what it looks like. There might be certain fears that you are going through. There might be certain battles that you're facing. But I want you to envision a victorious moment in that. Just like David envisioned what his victory would look like. I want you to envision those things. I want you to envision towards the call God has called you towards too. Envision the things. Begin to see it in the Spirit. Begin to see it in the Spirit. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are the cold. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. 
Jasper has been saying it time and again vision to see if you don't see your destiny or the destination that you want to reach you cannot reach there it's both spiritually and also for your life begin to envision develop uh, an art or a nature envision things that you want, the things that should happen to you, you must see it before. See it before. It is possible. The word of God, if you are constant touch with the spirit of the Lord and the word of God, the Holy Spirit does give you a vision for your own life. And you can be and you will be what you want to be when you are led by the spirit of the Lord. Just take that in your heart. I mean just to just don't hear it and just go and forget about it. Begin to think somewhere during this day, a couple of times, let this come back to you. Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord, you gave us your nature when you created us. Lord, you called the things which were not as if they were because you saw them before. And it's the same nature you have given to us. Lord, you want us to be like you. To grow like you, Father. Let that spirit settle upon everyone who's here in this house today. Yes, Father God. There'll be people who are visionaries beginning with their own life and doing great things in the days to come in the kingdom. Many young people rise up to be powerful men and women of God, Father God, in this house. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Jasper bringing this word. Continue to use him for your glory. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's give a hand to the Lord.